Hey everybody, uh, I'm Jamin Warren. I'm the founder of Kill Screen. Um, Kill Screen is an arts and culture organization committed to the practice of advancing interdisciplinary play. We were founded back in 2010 and we're trying to drive the intersection between design, culture and impact um, ultimately through cross-disciplinary collaboration. So really trying to show the world like why play matters. Uh, a big part of what we're trying to do is breaking down barriers that have traditionally kept play and culture in different arenas and separated from other creative pursuits. Um, so we've just started doing webinars, it's our third one. So please bear with us if there are any issues uh, whatsoever. And just a couple of housekeeping notes for everybody. Um, for Zoom, click hide non-video participants. So if you see Camille or the, um, I believe it's just like a little kill screen logo, feel free just to hide that person. Um, also, we'll be recording this and posting it later. Um, so if you want to go back and like, you know, I know Zach is going to say some wonderful, wonderful things that you want to go back and revisit over and over again. Um, there's also Q&A. So if you have questions, we filled some questions from folks before this event started. Um, if you want to use the little Q&A button, um, we can take a look at it. I'll try and answer questions as they come up. If you'd like us to use your name, or not use your name, please let us know. And if you would, uh, if your name has a, um, a pronounce, as someone with an unusual pronunciation for my first name, it's Jamin, long A, um, type that in as well. I wanna make sure I represent everybody um, as best as possible. And if you have any technical questions, you can also drop those in the Q&A. We will answer them private, you know, answer questions privately if you have anything that comes up. You can follow us on Twitter um, or on Instagram at killscreen.com, uh, so. Cool. All right. So without further ado here, let me share my screen. Um, all right. All right. So this is uh, our talk on balancing a career as a game designer and visual artist with Zach Gage, who's the other person with me right now. Zach is a game designer programmer, educator, and conceptual artist from New York City. Um, his work often explores the powerful intersection of systems and social dynamics, both through recontextualizing existing systems and structures in digital and physical games, as well as framing entirely new systems through original games. Um, an IBM alumni, Apple Design, and the Game of the Year award winner and BAFTA nominee, he's exhibited internationally at venues like the Venice Biennale, uh, the New York um, uh, uh, Venice Biennale, New York's MoMA, the Japanese American National Museum in, in Los Angeles, XOXO Festival in Portland, Future Everything in Manchester, and the Center for Contemporary Art in Warsaw, as well as in Apple stores worldwide. Um, he's also had a solo exhibition at Postmasters in New York City, which we'll talk about as well. Um, Zach's work has been featured in several online and printed publications, including New York Times, Art in America, New York Times Magazine, you get a twofer there, New York Times and New York Times Magazine, um, as well as Edge, New York Magazine, lots of wonderful places. Um, he's made a lot of work, which we'll talk about today, including Spell Tower, uh, or worked with others on games like Ridiculous Fishing. Um, works includes Lose Lose, Flip Flop Solitaire, Really Bad, bad Chess. We'll go through a, a bunch of different things here with Zach. So I guess we can all virtually welcome Zach to the, uh, Zach to the stage. Um, all right. Well, Zach, I mean, I think maybe just to get started, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Like, how did you get into the process of um, of creating uh, of creating things? Like, um, you know, as a as a as a conceptual as a visual artist and as a as a game designer. Sure. Uh, I'm trying to figure out every time I uh, tell the story, I try to figure out how to make it shorter. Um, <laughs> well, we'll see how it goes. Uh, so I, I, I uh, come from a family of artists and I grew up surrounded by art and art museums, um, but I always loved video games. And uh, my mom, uh, who told me I wasn't allowed to bring her up today, <laughs> um, <laughs> basically told me that I wasn't allowed to have video games, but um, if I wanted to make them, that she would buy me the tools to do that. So um, when I was younger, I had a lot of software like Hyper Studio or KidPix, which I would use to make rudimentary games. Um, and then uh, growing up, I uh, did a, the cool thing and went to computer camp for a couple of years and then taught at computer camp, um, learning programming. And uh, then in high school, some of my friends who also were, who were better programmers than me, we would take classes together and, and we would just ignore the classes and I would just program games with them and we'd figure out how everything worked. Um, and then uh, by the time I went to college, I kind of really fell into it with art and I 
was really interested in photography and design, um, painting, figure drawing, all the normal college art stuff that people would do. And by the end of my career in college, um, I was trying to figure out what I was going to do for my senior show. And I started to recall uh, this stuff that I had seen in high school, like early flash animation stuff, stuff like mm. PlayStation.com um, that had really fascinated me. And I realized, you know, I haven't done programming in a while, but I just spent four years figuring out how to be an artist. And I have all this programming chops from when I was in high school. Maybe I could do this kind of art. Maybe this is something that I could do that would be a really unique show um, for my senior thesis. And so I set out to do uh, a few different projects um, that I used processing for, which is a uh, language um, at the time it was Java. Now it's mostly JavaScript where people do processing. And it was basically a programming language for artists. And it was sort of very early on in the time of processing. Um, and I really remember like going to the uh, philosophy, <laughs> psychology building to meet with a, a professor who had once worked for um, uh, Pixar and he describes to me how like uh, image differencing worked and then I had to figure it out to like do camera tracking with people um, for my show and so I did a bunch of pieces and um, it was really fun and I moved to New York City and uh, I was encouraged to go check out Ivy which is like a, a, a mixed media space in New York City where they had residencies and um, there I met Zach Lieberman who was doing a project called Open Frameworks which is like a C++ version of processing um, and I got really into that and uh, I basically uh, wrote documentation for him um, and in exchange for him teaching me how this whole thing worked um, and that got me really into doing a lot of projects with um, with open frameworks and doing these sort of larger installation projects, thinking about conceptual projects. I think I just have always loved conceptual art. Um, Saul LeWitt and Encore are, are my two favorite artists. And um, so I was just kind of naturally drawn to that. Um, and then it's kind of in the middle of that process of doing all of this artwork. Sorry, so I'm, yeah, you can see I've really failed at trying to make the story short. Um, no, 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 I, I love it. It's great to hear I, all this background. I was in graduate school. Um, getting my MFA at Parsons, doing a lot of this, like really my first very serious set of this conceptual artwork. And as part of my thesis there, I made a game called Lose Lose. And Lose Lose was, you know, at the time, the idea was I wanted to do a series of projects that talked about how we were, we were beginning to live inside of our computers, that these things weren't just calculators that we had on our desks, um, but actually spaces that we lived in. And you know, in the late 2000s, that was a little bit radical for people. Now, obviously, nobody would bat an eye at that. Of course, we live in our computers. Um, but this was before everybody was really on Twitter. And um, one of the projects that I did was meant to sort of like put down a foundation and like prove to you that like yes, we really did do this. And the idea was that if you have these um, photos in your life in an album, you really treasure them. But if you have them on your computer, you just treat them like trash and you know, maybe they get deleted and, and you, it's an accident. Um, and that that's weird because uh, these photos are really important to us, that our digital files are meaningful in the same way that physical things are meaningful. And to right, illustrate yeah. this, I built this project called Lose Lose, which was like Space Invaders, um, but you, uh, if you killed any of the aliens in the game, it would delete random files on your computer. And if you died, then the app itself would be deleted. And the idea was that I was gonna like make this game and nobody would ever play it, but uh, just its existence would like make people upset. And then those people who were upset would have to sort of interrogate why they were upset and realize that like, yes, these things are meaningful to us, um, which isn't what happened. Um, lots of people played it. And, uh, but I was successful in getting a lot of people really pissed off at me. Gamers were particularly angry and they wrote all these very uh, vitriolic forum posts that I read every single one of. And amongst these forum posts, there was one that I really wish I had um, where a gamer described art to another gamer. They like described why Lose Lose was art and like justified it, but they didn't use the word art. They right. <laughs> described what art was. And I was like, oh my God, this is incredible. Like this is a group of people who's describing conceptual art, the hardest of all the art <laughs> to another person without even having any background in art history. And, and I realized that like, 
the literacy of interactive games, like the tools that we use to understand and, and traverse these spaces is the same literacy as interactive art. It's just the literacy of interaction. And unlike art, which is, you know, a couple of people go to museums, millions of people play video games. And even more, we're starting to play video games every year because this was also the dawning of the app store and like the sort of, you know, when it changed from, you know, some people play video games to every single person you know plays a video game because they play something on their phone. Um, and I just got so excited about this idea that there were all of these new people coming to this space. Yeah. Um, and then that kind of just kicked off my career and I've sort of been riding that wave ever since. Um, with, you know, with Lose Lose, was the was this like a customer service complaint? Like, what was the nature? Like, you know, you're pretty clear, like with lose lose, like this is going to some, this is going to be something that happens. So, is the complaint that like you didn't like I didn't know you're serious, or was the complaint that like I'm just curious, like for people who I, people are were just angry, angry, angry about the idea, like the notion that <laughs> someone could could content, could like smash these two things together, that a game could be dangerous and like could hurt you. I think it's it's like, it, it is an attack, right? And it was supposed to be, it was meant to be provocative. And the idea was that like, this is something that like you might fear, like it's frightening to have this thing be there. It's kind of like if somebody did an artwork where the artwork was, you know, putting a, a gun, a loaded gun in a gallery on a pedestal, right? That's terrifying. Right. And like, right. you yeah. can see why you would be upset about somebody doing that. Like I wouldn't go to that gallery and I would be like, wow, that's in America right now, you do that. <laughs> yeah. like fucked up, man. Don't, that's yeah. not an appropriate thing. And I think it's that kind of visceral reaction that people had to this, especially video game players who were used to just sort of being able to, you know, interact with things in whatever way they want to and, and doing it in an environment that's, you know, safe, even though they're doing these things that are like very violent. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's, I think, the approach. Yeah, I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, there are some museums that won't showcase, um, like design museums, like won't showcase um, like swords or other like weapons used in war as design objects because of, you know, because what they represent, like what, what they're explicitly designed um, like to do and to not interrogate that would be, you know, we shouldn't put those on the same pedestal as, you know, a design, you know, Eames chair or right. something, something along those lines. Um, well, I, I'd like to talk about, um, you know, Fortune, which, you know, I think you would describe as kind of being um, like an early synthesis of some of the thinking that you were doing around games, um, you know, as a player, but also as a early designer, and then also your background as a, you know, as a creator as well. Can you tell us a little bit about Fortune and kind of like what that, um, I don't know, what that signified for you as a, as a creator? Yeah, so Fortune is a, a physical fortune teller that basically builds fortunes out of uh, modified public tweets. So we'll search Twitter for um, things that people are doing or saying or thinking about, and then essentially change the perspective on them to sort of be in a sort of, you're going to do or say or think about these things. Um, and uh, it was really early on in my career, the um, there was a little bit more of a overt ping ponging between doing art and doing games. And I think that has um, reduced uh, sort of significantly now, but this was like one of the first art pieces I did after spending a couple of years really seriously making games and then coming back to do um, some artwork. And not that, and I should also say, I don't really like to, to me, I view that the games I'm making as art are part of my art practice, but it's sort of easier to describe uh, it's less mouth mouthfully to say like, um, you know, gallery, conceptual fine art and like video game art. It's easier to just say games and art, um, even though <laughs> it's all art. You're um, multi-hyphenate. I believe that's the term yeah. that they often use on, on Instagram. I'm right. like, a, yeah, I'm a healer as well as, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to put too many hashtags after of course. Thing. Of course. Um, so yeah, so that was that was fortunate. And I think the thing that 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 was really funny about this piece is uh, a lot of the art that I was doing before Fortune was um, the interactive element of it was more uh, sort of like a really um, it was more about thinking about the way that the 
the viewer is going to enter into the gallery and encounter this piece and what are the the moments that are going to be salient to them that are going to like slowly um like change in their mind and turn the piece into something for them which is i think similar to the way that the interaction works with the painting i guess i would say most of my interactive works were more like paintings they're static things but i don't want to undersell sort of the thinking about how somebody is going to like understand and, and grapple with something. Um, but fortune is like you walk up to it and you push it. It's like it's not um, it's not like a passive interaction in, in any way. Um, and it was funny to, to exhibit because people would walk up to it and it, it was everybody was very uncomfortable about it. But then after a couple people pushed the button, a crowd would show up and everybody would sort of stand around it. And like they, people would take turns pushing the button and reading their things and, and talking about them. Um, and I realized that like part of the joy of this piece was just that like pushing a button and getting a reward is really fun. And it, that wasn't part of what I meant to do when I built it, but afterwards it was really easy to see how years of developing games had really influenced my art project. Mm. It's really, that is what a game is, is you push a button and you get a reward. And that's, <laughs> well, um, and I, that's, that's to me, I think what kind of really, um, it was like I'd returned to doing art and I brought this, this whole other world of like interaction with me without really thinking about it. And it infused some of the design stuff that I was doing. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, loot box mechanic, like that type of mechanic yeah. is, I mean, it always needs to be in the service of something hopefully more meaningful, right? It's not just about like, and in your instance, you're not just trying to like extract, it's not like insert a dollar, push the button, and then you get your, your Right, fortune. it's ga gotcha poetry, basically. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's a great way to think about it. Um, I, I, What do you think that that... Um, that hesitance around people coming into a gallery space and interacting with a piece like where does that like come from like i remember i was at the museum of modern art and um you know there was like a giant you know john chamberlain piece and i saw someone like this guy just came up to it and just started like knocking on the side of this like giant steel kind of crashed car he just wanted to see what it felt like and of course the docents were like whoa, whoa yeah. <laughs> please don't <laughs> please don't touch the art so i you know i was curious like how do you know as a game designer you're so used to people in your, it's a part of the process like you do play tests you have people kind of a part of your process so i was curious how, how are you thinking about like the way when people walk into a space and they interact with something that you want them to touch how are you thinking about that like as both as an artist and as a as a designer aside from bribes there's always well, that's a that's a great question um and actually i think that kind of inadvertently gets to the heart of why gamers have this literacy and why so many art patrons don't is because the rules of the space are totally different right when you enter into a gallery nobody's expecting to be a performer um, and most people want to be a performer and because you're standing amongst audience members if you're a performer your audience is very big um, mm. it's very uncomfortable in a gallery but in a video game you go in expecting to be a performer and your audience is nobody because you're <laughs> probably sitting on the couch by yourself in the middle of the night playing a video yeah. Um, and I think that that kind of comfort is part of why uh, the literacy of interaction is so simple to grapple with if you're a game player and so difficult um, if you're in a gallery. So yeah, of course, of course, uh, it is very hard in a gallery to get anybody to interact with anything. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, my, my feeling has always been um, you just need to, uh, I think it's also very difficult to get anyone in a gallery to think about anything or to, or to you know, in, engage with any thoughts that might not be the thing that they're already, you know, there to think about. And so my feeling has always been that it's good to um, try to like either make a small joke or, or try to catch someone by surprise. Like if you can make someone perform by accident, then like, you've demonstrated what the performance is to other people in the gallery. Um, and so frequently, if you can do that, then those other people will be excited. Like there are people out there who will be excited to be a part of the performance, um, but they won't do it until they've seen somebody else do it and they realize like, oh, here are the parameters. Like that's the biggest thing is to get people to understand what the parameters are so that they can yeah. go in and do their improvisation um, the way that they want. And then, and then the other thing is like sometimes if you make a joke or you um, do something funny, you can get people to let down their their guard and have them 
um, and get them to experience something that then later they'll sit back and be like, oh, wait a minute, like maybe, maybe the thing that I experienced, maybe it didn't make sense. And I need to like step back and question a bunch of things that I had previously held because this experience didn't fit with the beliefs that I had before going into this. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that makes a ton of sense. I think um, it, we had a great conversation on the site with um, uh, with Indian artist Gayatri Kodakal. And that was one of the things that she talked about was like when she was showing her work, um, there was so much training also that needed to happen, like in gallery context, like every, it's not, you can't just put stuff there. Like it needs to be presented in a particular way and as like can be a, a big um, like operational lift for gallery spaces, particularly smaller ones where, you know, you don't have a team of people who can guide someone through each and every experience. And so um, trying to create those opportunities for people to do stuff with your art is always a yeah. real challenge. Yeah, I think also another thing that I just realized is the other trick is also putting a reward very close to the front of the interaction. So like, don't save the reward of the interaction to the end. Give, give people something immediate to, to go off of so that they're excited about being a part of this thing and then like they'll go deeper on their own. Hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I want to move on a little bit and talk about um, some of your like more formal, uh, let me just share my screen here. Um, all right. Some of your, uh, I guess your, your commercial quote unquote, uh, you know, that's part of your work as a, as a visual artist. And then you also have um, your work as a, as a game designer on, you know, Apple's app store. Um, I, one question I have for you is like, so when you go to like a dinner party or something, I guess when we have those again, and people like ask, you said earlier, like saying what you do, like encompassing what you do is kind of a little bit of a mouthful. Like that said, like, how do you situate yourself as a, you know, I guess what goes on your like LinkedIn profile, <laughs> uh, uh, like I, as a creator? Uh, very poorly, mostly. Um, I, I, what I generally say is that um, I'm an artist and I also design video games, um, but that's a terrible way to do it because uh, if you say you're an artist, nobody has any questions for you. Um, and if you say you make video games, the only question that they ever have is, oh, what have you made? Have I played it? Like, what's that? I love Halo. Do you know that game? Um, and then and then I have to say, oh, I mostly make games for mobile. And then nobody has any questions for me anymore. Um, so so it is uh, pretty tough. I don't I don't have a good answer. Maybe um, maybe in another 10 years, I'll have a good answer for how to how to talk about this. I try to say that I make games that are um, um, deep and accessible hmm. um, and those are two words that mostly nobody cares about either so <laughs> i'm still working on that. um well um jd gardner we asked some some folks for questions in advance and jd gardner had asked about your prototyping process so do you do pen and paper or like when you're sitting down and creating something um how does that what does that look like for you sure well that i can definitely talk about <laughs> give a really short version um pretty much um I'm really into, uh, Saul Lewitt has a piece uh, called Sentences on Conceptual Art that is like basically my art Bible. And um, one of the big uh, points of that piece is basically that um, ir irrational thoughts, like subconscious thoughts are, are the important ones for art. That's where the art comes from. That rational thoughts just beget rational things. And if you want some irrational deep stuff, you really have to like follow your subconscious. And, I really take that to heart um, for all of my work. And I really put a distinction between, like when I talk about design, I'm really talking about the rational part of the process. And then the sort of prototyping and the conceptualization, that's the irrational part of the process. So um, typically all of my art or my games uh, follows um, a pretty similar start, which is I have some kind of experience or an emotion or a thought um, that just strikes me. And then I think about what's the quickest possible way that I could try to um, dig into this. Like, can I, you know, if it's a game, how do I prototype it the fastest? If it's a card game and I have this idea of something I want to do with cards, maybe I'm just thinking about like piles and the way that piles of cards work. Are there like three rules that I could come up with that would allow me like right off the bat that would just allow me to interrogate this idea with cards? Um, and so I'll do that and then I'll sit down and I'll shuffle a deck of cards and I'll just deal them out on the table as sort of like a half game um, and start playing it and see if any part of it is exciting or fun. 
Um, and then uh, oftentimes, if it's if I'm lucky, I'll, I'll hit something where it's like, oh, this idea where like I could take this card and put it here, that was really cool. Like, is there a way that I could tweak this so that that happens more so that I can like dig into that portion of this? Um, and then if I can, then I'll try to keep following that until it turns into a game. And then if it turns into a game, I'll make a digital version of it and I'll try to play it for like 10 or 15 hours until I'm incredibly good at it. And then if it lasts long enough for me to hit that point, then I think, okay, you know, now I'm the best at this. Is there a way that I can branch it out and make it so that it's now fun again for another 20 or 30 hours? Like, are there spins I can do on it? Is there some tweak that I missed in my speed to do this? Um, right. And then, uh, and then if I can, then I'll do that. And then the game's done. And then I think about how to release it and it comes out. Um, so basically, I just make a lot of things. And they're almost all failures. And sometimes they're not failures. Um, and those are the ones that come up. Well, I guess speaking in the not failure category, I mean, how does that apply to like for really bad chess? Like what was the, you told me, I mean, everybody's familiar with chess, I think as a, as a game, um, you know, your take on it was, you know, um, randomizing different elements of it. Initially, it was just um, randomizing like the pieces themselves, um, which as someone who occasionally when you get like six queens or something like that, I was like, well, this is, I'm, I'm going to be good. I'm all set along with like daily challenges where you kind of present people some opportunities. Um, yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about that, the design process for, for that particular game, kind of like aside from like the title really bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so really this is another team. game that got a lot of gamers mad at me actually. <laughs> While we're on that topic. Um, but yeah, so really bad chess. Uh, it actually, this is probably, um, of digital prototypes, this is the fastest game I ever designed. Um, I was hanging out with one of my friends who uh, had been playing chess with another one of my friends. And he was like, dude, you should play, we should play chess. Like, we should get into chess. And I was like, man, I hate chess. I've never been into chess. Like, you're probably pretty good, right? And he was like, yeah, I guess I'm getting better. <laughs> like, yeah, so like, we can't even play each other because like, you're gonna just totally demolish me. Anybody um, who says anybody who says like, "Hey, we should really pay, play chess yeah. together," is exactly a person that you should not be playing chess against. <laughs> well, right. But I was like, but like, man, we're sitting, you know, outside, and it would be great if we could play chess. Like, I would like to play chess. I just don't want to like read a book to like figure out how to play this dumb game. This is the only game I know that I would have to read a book to play. Like, that's stupid. Like, let me engage with it the way that I play everything else. Like, I just want to sit down and. Yeah. have fun and figure it out as I go. Um, and uh, I was thinking about that and I realized that like randomness, so one of my favorite games is poker. And poker uh, uses randomness really well in a way that's incredibly impressive in that poker, you can have a night, a, a weekly poker game with your friends and play poker for 15 years. And at the, at the end of 15 years, someone can show up to your poker night who's never played poker before in their life and sit there and beat everybody. Um, and that's like not common. And it's not like that, it's not that poker doesn't, you know, have an incredible skill to it. Like it does, like you're learning over these 15 years, you're getting better and better. But because of the way that randomness works and because of the particular lying nature of poker, um, it's very doable to have that kind of experience. And so I thought maybe there's a way that, that I could apply randomness to chess and make it way more accessible to people of different skill levels. Um, and I thought maybe I'll just make all the pieces random. And it turns out that you have to do a little tiny bit more than that. There are a couple things that become unfair. Like if, you know, I, I never put the rooks or the queens in the front row in really bad chess. Um, so there is like a little bit, it's a little mediated randomness, but basically I was like, maybe if I make them random, we'll be able to play each other. And my friend was like, oh, you should call it really bad chess. And I was like, well, now I have to make it because that's a great name. And so I went and I bought um, on the Unity app store, I bought a chess prototype um, for like 15 bucks. And in 15 minutes, I had it playing random pieces and mm. it had an AI built in. And I was like, well, I don't know, maybe the AI will work. So I just hit play and I played off my first game of chess ever against an AI that I didn't think would even be able to play the game. And it was pretty good. Um, and I got to a point where I had to checkmate it. And I was like, oh my God, I have no idea how to checkmate a computer. I've never done this before. I don't even know how to play chess. Now I have to figure out how to checkmate. Um, and it was really fun. It turns out figuring out how to checkmate is like pretty cool. That's a cool first way to start learning chess. Um, yeah. and so immediately I was like, well, this is 
really fun. This is a whole new way for me to get into chess. And if it's a new way for me to get into chess, then it's probably a new way for other people to get into chess. And so this thing that really started as I want to play another human turned into, well, actually, like, you know, playing against an AI is really fascinating too. And and I'm learning the real nuances of an AI. I'm playing the AI as if it's a human because I'm playing, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 games against this, this thing. And it's getting better every game. It's getting better pieces. So I really, I have to learn like where it, where it fails, um, like, and be able to trick it into these positions where I know it can't perform well. Um, and that was really interesting too. And then, then I was like, wow, this is really like poker. This is what poker is like. Right. You yeah. Out where your friends are, are bad. And then you think like, okay, how can I like needle them into this kind of emotional situation? Or like, I just did this with the cards. I know that they're going to misread this. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that was, that was the process. It was really wild to build something in 15 minutes. That was like a video game and have it be fun. Um, usually that doesn't happen. Yeah, well, maybe the next generation of, you know, grandmasters in chess will say like, oh, I, you know, I started with really bad chess and then, you know, <laughs> start with really bad chess and then work my way back. So thank you, Zach Gage, for we'll see. that would be a real trip. Yeah. Um, well, you know, along the lines of, you know, we were talking earlier about kind of this like, you know, artist and game designer. Um, I, you know, so you, you were part of, um, you know, Apple Arcade, and you, I was just curious, like, how you think about, I mean, the, the, the obvious kind of, sort of the monkey in the room is always, like, like, how does one support themselves, and how do you find that balance between those two people, and um, you obviously have been, have been, like, very blessed in the sense that you are, you've been successful in both arenas, right? But you can sort of see where someone might, you might have more traditional artist who, visual artist who's like very successful in that field, but really wants to be making games and is unsure about how to make a jump. And you might have a very successful, someone who's been designing games and is looking to make that jump. So yeah, I was just curious, like, how do you think about maybe some of those more like practical questions around like how to build a practice that allows for you to be both of those things? Because I, I, that's something I admire you for. You've done an excellent job of like, you don't you have made compromises on either end you're making things that you really want to make in both arenas and have managed those really really well so yeah for anybody who's thinking about doing something similar would love to hear your thoughts on that oh thanks that's very nice of you to say um you know so i'm really risk averse as a person um and i think my approach has always just been like trying to hedge my bets basically um so you know when i first got out of school I went and worked at a web company where I basically made banner ads. Um, and I quit when I found myself browsing a blog about banner ads. And I was like, oh my God, I'm reading about banner ads. Like this is very bad. Um, but what was fortunate about that was I was able to, um, you know, I, I was able to retain some of my connections to the company and, uh, and they were able to provide me with sort of offsite work for a while. So I did, you know, contracting for them, making banner ads and small banner ad games for them. Um, and then at the same time, you know, I also was pretty fluent with technology and games at a time when not that many people were fluent with technology and games. And so teaching became a really uh, viable opportunity for me. Um, and so what I could do is I would sort of under figure out how much money I needed to be making. And I would um, intersperse doing commercial projects um, and teaching, and then um, spending a couple of days then on in my week making games and making art. And so I would just kind of alternate back and forth um, with the hope that that each of my practices would bolster the other. Right? If I'm teaching, I'm encountering all these new ideas, and I'm meeting great people, and I'm seeing beautiful work that students are making all the time, and I can use that as you know, an inspiration and a drive to go home and in my, you know, free time, be able to do great work. Um, and if, and, uh, you know, if I'm doing uh, side projects, I can um, use those projects to make money so that I don't have to, you know, I can survive and, and do work. And then with my games, I can use my time making games and making art to make myself more appealing to teaching jobs and to advertising jobs because uh, basically, people will only hire you to do what you demonstrated you can do. And so <laughs> be in an environment where you can demonstrate that you can do things that are weird or that most people, you know, 
you know, there's a whole world of stuff that you need to have free time to be able to learn it and to demonstrate that you can do it. Yeah. And if you can do that as, as, a, as an artist on the side, it's really lucrative because now all of a sudden it's like, oh, a, a, you know, a company wants to create an interactive work for a, a watch. And it's like, well, who are they going to go to? Who's done interactive, you know, installation work? Well, people who have free time to do that stuff on the side of doing their other careers. And, and so I would be able to um, essentially start to land bigger and bigger projects, things that were more and more lucrative so that I could... Right spend less time doing them and more time doing the artwork. And uh, that continued for a number of years until I eventually made a game that made enough money that I could stop doing all of that stuff and only focus on games for a couple of years. Hmm. And at that point, um, the spending a couple of years focusing on games was enough to sort of like solidify a career um, and, uh, and basically just continue to do this, which, you know, it's not, I guess it's more complicated than that. I think there are a lot of moments in that career where I sort of still felt like it was a hobby and I needed to figure yeah. out, okay, how do I turn this hobby into a business? What are the, what are the decisions that I could make that are going to grow my audience and be able to, you know, bring my existing audience into my new projects to be able to maintain these things being lucrative. How can I talk about these projects and do the kind of PR that I need to do to be able to maintain a relationship with the press so that I can um, rely on people to promote my work after it comes out. I spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, because I'm coming from art, are there ways that I can promote my games that are more about the spirit of what I'm trying to do rather than the game itself? I feel like a lot of games press is basically, you know, just a, a press release about the game coming out. Here's a new yeah. Metroidvania. Here's a new, you know, multiplayer game. Um, but with my games, I tried to be more about the artistic side of things, which ended up working really well. I think, you know, in, in the sense of really bad chess, I pitched a lot of stories that were about fairness and being like, you know what, fairness is overrated. Fairness is not something that we care about. We say we care about it, but we actually don't. And I made a game to demonstrate that point, and it's about chess. Um, and that <laughs> got me on NPR. So, like, it definitely <laughs> works. I think, you know, we're in a time when a lot of mainstream press is really desperate to talk about games because they understand that games are so important in the world. Yeah. And this is right around the time when you launched Kill Screen. So, you were also like very on top of this wave. Um, you know, it's like games are becoming meaningful, but like, games are also impossible to talk about because the last yeah. thing you want to do as a journalist is spend three paragraphs explaining how a game works yeah, and what are yeah, the yeah. rules and here's how it works. Like that stuff sucks, no one wants to read it. So if you can provide a way for journalists to talk about games without ever explaining the rules, that's like a real magical moment for them. And I think that was really helpful um, with, with the press. And then just in general, I think the, the other thing I'd say is that you know, I think there's like a real um, frustrating link between uh, the way that people think artists are supposed to talk about money. And I feel like um, it's really strongly linked to galleries and, and museums and institutions wanting to exert a huge amount of control on artists. The idea that like artists are not supposed to be thinking about money or thinking about making money, but yet artists are supposed to spend half their time like ingratiating themselves to gallery owners or writing grants to get money. Like it just didn't add up to me. To me, it feels like the, the truest way that I can um, support myself and my work and be honest about the things that I'm trying to do is uh, is by having an audience that appreciates the things that I'm trying to do and having them yeah. make money for them because you know then I'm only I'm not beholden to any third party I'm beholden to the people who actually enjoy the work that I'm doing yeah um, so yeah. I really thought a lot about how to how to build that up and how to focus that and what my values were you know how do I you know are there things that I can do to to improve the number of people who are playing my games or know about my games that are still in line with my values. So for, in, for instance, I think, you know, cross promotion between games, when you say it like that, it's like, well, that's, <laughs> not, that's not in line with anyone's values. That's gross. That's a weird, like icky PR thing. But for me, it was like, I could do, you know, I have a menu at the top of my apps that's got a little heart on it and you click it and, and it's like, got a picture of me. And I'm like, hey, I made this game. Here's some other things I made. And so you know, that's cross promotion, but it's also a way for me to 
you know, push this idea that like the things that we're playing, these are not made by corporations. These are made by human beings. These, there are people behind the stuff and yeah, yeah. and visions and desires, and they're building this thing that you're experiencing in a way that's meaningful to them. So I think there are a lot of ways often um, when you're thinking about uh, business stuff where you can take these tools and structures that are out there that everybody is using in these extremely boring ways and sort of fit them around your work in a way that's like really personal and meaningful and yeah things you're trying to say yeah yeah well i, I want to ask you about like some of the um like collaborative challenges that you might face right so you know i'm thinking you know on the one hand here let's see take a look at uh at card of darkness um and so that has you know that's working with pendleton ward from adventure time and a variety of other and i was curious like what were the things that you were able to bring, bring from your artistic practice to that project um that you could sort of i because i you know in your games you often work with other people so I was, you, describe the game a little bit for folks who haven't played and then i'd love to hear a little bit about like maybe how some of the artistic practice side of what you've done has informed um this game and then we'll kind of try to take a look in the other direction as well. Sure, so yeah, so Card of Darkness um, is a, a card adventure game um, that's currently on Apple Arcade and it's meant to be a, a very accessible version of the sort of very inaccessible roguelike genre. Um, everything in the game is just picking up cards. So you just are choosing which cards to pick up and each card has a variety of effects and every card only has one number on it. So, there's no complicated things to memorize. You just need to sort of pick up cards in a very clever way to be able to make it through levels and go on this adventure and story. And it was a project that um, I did with my friends at Choice Provisions and Pendleton Ward. Penn and I met a number of years ago at GDC and we were trying to come up with a project for a long time that we could do together. Um, and this one seemed like the right one. Uh, it wasn't just Pendleton, Nelson Bowles um, was also on the art team. Um, along with some other artists, but um, Nelson and Penn really art directed the game. Um, I think probably the biggest thing for me in these and my art practice is artists are always surprised that I know how to draw and use Photoshop. <laughs> and it's like really nice to be able to interact with them in a way where like they'll send me something and I can like mock it up and change it and send it back to them. And, and they'll be like, oh yeah, sure, let's do that. <laughs> um, and that was actually a really big part of how we did the art for this game. Uh, not all of the work, but a lot of it. Um, for instance, right now, the uh, the spinder, the sort of purple guy with the three eyes on the two and the three and the single screenshot, that's actually my drawing. And Penn just took it and drew over it and animated it and sort of like added a lot of heart to it. And so for a lot of the original drawings, um, Penn and I were sort of really directly collaborating where I would sort of mock up what I thought that creature should look like and then he would bring them to life, which was a real treat. It's pretty wild to make a stupid drawing and then have an incredibly talented animator uh, turn it into some living, breathing thing. Um, so that was really fun. Um, other than that, you know, I think actually my uh, artist practice with collaboration is something that I'm very much working on. I think I worked alone for a very long time. Um, and so, uh, fortunately, I don't have a lot of baggage with collaboration. I think I've become sort of a, a more mature artist and human being. And so being able to dig into collaborative practice now has been really exciting, I think, because I don't have, you know, I didn't work with people for a very long time when I was less mature and didn't know what I was doing. And so I don't have a lot of baked in habits. And I think I approach collaboration now and very intentional way where I know I don't know what I'm doing and I'm trying to to my best to be like very communicative and learn how to you know work with people and make sure they're comfortable and make yeah sure we get the best work out of them and for the last two years um, I've been working with uh, Jack Schlesinger on games and it's been really fun to work with somebody else you know almost every day and yeah and start to get good at collaborating but it sounds like from a tools perspective, like um, like having some tool in common with the game makers that you're working with can be very helpful. Um, not a requirement, obviously, but like it sounds like having something that you can um, help bridge the gap. I mean, I understand like Unity can sometimes be that tool for people who work in Unity and haven't worked in a games context. I guess Photoshop sounds like that's one as well. Um, but it sounds like that was very useful for you as a creator in terms of like um, speaking, a, a, having some language, so to speak, in common. Yeah, I think, you know, the best art and the best 
game designs, they're not things that you can clearly communicate with a sentence, right? If you could, then you'd write a book. You wouldn't be <laughs> making a game or making a painting or whatever. And so I think um, that's a lot of where the struggle is uh, with collaborating. I know it was um, the music. I'm actually really bad at communicating music uh, thoughts. And so the music on, on Card of Darkness, um, my wife is a musician and she was trying to help me communicate with a musician and what we ended up coming up with was um i would come up with uh a like an idea of like a place and a weather setting and then i would say this this song should sound like you're standing on a cliff looking out at the ocean um and in the sunshine or this song should feel like you're in the forest and it's raining um and that was how that actually ended up being the perfect way that like he would always like be like oh great and send me a song that would be perfect yeah, um, yeah. And I think communicating in that uh, sort of level of, of vagary, but like still with intense, you know, intentionality is really, really hard um, with visual art. It's, um, and it also, you know, a lot of the ideas that people have are bad. And it's really helpful if you see a visual, <laughs> you know, a visual thing and you're like, mm, this yeah. would be better if there was something here. And then you boot up Photoshop and you draw something there and you're like, no, that's not really what I meant. And then you change it and you get it to something that's good, but still, you know, rudimentary, and then you send it back. And so you've cut out, you know, so many steps of the process of back and forth where the person didn't understand what you're talking about because you just yeah. could do it. You could do that little bit of exploration in yourself. Yeah. I mean, as a former music journalist, I can tell you that is often a real, a real challenge. Certainly with, like, what does a horn sound like? What are the right. words that describe what a horn sounds like? And it's like horn like so everything else is like sounds don't have we don't have language to describe sounds so you often have to find figurative ways to describe like a mirror, right that's you know? why we have sounds yeah <laughs> that's uh that is the that is the that is the purpose i uh i'm a big bird watcher and that's one of the things humans and birds have developed it's a example of like convergent evolution where both humans and birds have used vocalizations but they use them for totally different things like for birds it's not like a language in the formal sense it's to communicate certain like need states or territory or whatever, whereas humans have, you know, they use sound as a way to communicate. But if you're a bird, that's like the only thing that you have, right? Um, right. Or not the only thing, but one of your main tools, whereas with humans, we have many things that we can, can certainly use. You gotta get um, birds horns. Yeah, I, that, I've been working on that as a side project of mine is getting tiny little, tiny little woodwinds for, for my bird friends. Um, well, going back the other way, and then um, we'll open it up for Q and A. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about, like, kind of in the other direction. So, you know, looking at here, let me share my screen here. Um, so, looking at two of your works, so glaciers, and then also um, transit meditation. Um, can you tell me a little bit about, like, so in those it's kind of the other direction, right? So you're working with more form formally established, um, like, artistic venues. So in this case, galleries or a festival. Tell me a little bit about what were some of the things that you were able to bring from, like, a game context, like, into an art context. Well, definitely, I mean, there's some pretty overt game stuff with transit meditation. Um, so maybe I'll start with glaciers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, transit meditation is definitely solidly in the middle, so yeah. Yeah, I think probably the biggest thing is that, you know, as I start to spend more time making games, uh, one of the things I realized is that like part of the thing that's really beautiful about games is they're about experience and they're about process, right? Like if you play, um, Call of Duty, you don't just play it one time, you play it every day. You come home from work, you sit down, you play Call of Duty, you know, you on the weekends, you call your friends, or you hop on, you all play Call of Duty together. There's like a, a process to that experience. So it's not just a one-off thing. It's not just, you know, there is a single player, but the multiplayer component of games is like about visiting and revisiting and reevaluating. One of the things that I started to realize is that with digital art, there is really very little process to it, even though there shouldn't be. You know, if you have a generative piece of art, often the way that we work with generative art is, you know, maybe I have a piece of art that can generate, you know, an infinite number of paintings. So I'll generate 90 and I'll sell them all as one-offs. And it's like, oh, this is a unique thing. Or I'll go to the website for it and I'll click a button and I'll see one and I go, oh, wow, what a cool thing. I can't believe that was generative. Um, but what you're not doing is, understanding the entirety of it. You're not hitting the button a hundred times. You're not putting a screen on your wall that's showing you a different generative version every single day. 
um, which is a totally different way to engage with a piece of art. And it's actually how paintings work. That's why we have paintings or sculptures. That's what it's like to have a, a painting or a sculpture in your home is you have it up and you see it every day. And sometimes you don't really pay attention to it. Um, other days you sit and you, you know, notice it and you stop and you look at it and you think about it. And then, uh, you know, other days you just go back to just walking right past it. And I think it's, uh, it's really like a, it's a kind of thing that you don't get the experience of if you're in a, in a museum, unless you have a favorite painting in a museum. And I think with amongst people who go to museums, it's very common for them to talk about like, oh, this is my favorite painting at the MoMA. I go to this museum, you know, I used to come here once a week and I would sit down and just look at this painting. And that's yeah, like yeah. how you are supposed to engage with a painting. That's what a painting is about. And with glaciers, I really, um, I had been talking to um, my friend Tomasz at Postmasters and he was like, Zach, you know, I really, we, I'd love to do a show with you, but because it's a gallery, like you have to make something that we can sell. We can't do a show if we can't sell it because that's like the model of the space. That's how it works. Um, so I was trying to think about what I could sell. Um, and I wanted something that I could sort of bulk manufacture, uh, you know, by hand, but still, you know, many pieces. Um, but I wanted, but I also wanted something that would feel really unique and each one would be unique. And I was thinking about this process of, of art and I thought about, you know, if I can make a piece of physical digital art that goes into people's homes, maybe I can engage with the process of paintings that I really want to have, that I want digital art to, to have. And so I came up with this work, Glaciers, which is basically um, Google autocomplete poems, which I think everybody in the world is familiar with. Um, and each one is, is their own autocomplete, but it, the, the thing that's special about it is that it's not, it's not um, a singular poem printed on a piece of paper or a funny tweet, you know, it's a live poem that updates over time. And so, you know, while you're seeing the part of this that surfaced, um, you know, against the law to offend someone, against the law to write on money, against the law to leave dog and car, um, what's actually going on underneath this is hundreds of thousands or millions of searches that are generating this poem and it's changing and it's going to change very very slowly but it will change and when it does change it'll be a different poem and uh, that poem is directly connected because of the volume of work that's gone into it to the specific moment in life that you're in right now and so I also started to, to think of these as sort of wall clocks for moments they're not mm. you know telling you time but they are denoting a time. Um, and so that's that's what that piece was. And even though I think it doesn't directly connect to games in any overt way, the idea of process, I think, really came out of my spending time with games. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, oh, sorry. I don't know if you had a... No, 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 no. I Wait, so, so I'm clear. So that changes as the search volume for what is when Google tweaks its algorithm or people change what the first part of that phrase is, your individual copy will change at some point in time someday yeah. maybe, so maybe or never <laughs> yeah so yeah yeah or never so they basically every 24 hours they they check and they see if it's different and then they refresh themselves and often it's not different um, but sometimes it is and and so you you do get this very strange experience of having this thing in your house that reads to your brain as static but then one day you you notice it and you're like oh that's not what it was that's different and then you sort of have this new experience with it yeah. Um, cool. Well, we're actually getting tight on time. Oh, so if you don't mind, I have one last question for you, because um, because we probably won't. Uh, if, if you want to check out work uh, Zach's work for transit meditation, highly encourage you to read about it on on uh, on Zach's website. Um, I did have one last question, and we'll see if we can um, open it up for for Q and A. Um, we, we got a question about about this work from Scarcity. Um, this is from um, from Benjamin Cordero, um, based in Chile. Um, this is a question for Zach. It's known that you are very against the fad of NFTs, as it shows in your last work, Scarcity. But it does feel like this technology is bound to invade and consume both video games and art sooner rather than later. Do you think that the process of creating in both these mediums is going to get lost in the midst of the over commercialization of these spaces or is there some space um, kind of in between and what do experimentations look like going forward 
um, Benjamin says that you're a big inspiration um, and is a part of their uh, part of what they want to be professionally. But did want to ask you about the context for this work scarcity. What do you think this What do you think this portends for the uh, for for the future for both video games and for art? Sure. Well, thank you. Um, and I, I don't want to. Um, I could talk for like an hour and get. <laughs> yeah, it's a separate. It's a whole other thing. So yeah. I'll try to avoid some of that, which I was also trying to avoid with this work. I really wanted to talk about art ownership and what ownership is about, which, you know, I don't think is a lot of what people were talking about around NFTs. Um, but I, I think something to just consider is that like, you know, art has survived for hundreds of years, regardless of the uh, economic medium surrounding it. That's sort of what art is. And even though I think it's really important for artists to be able to um, be sustainable and, and make money and, and, and do that for their work, um, you know, the people who are afraid of, of economics uh, corrupting art are the people who are deeply invested economically in art. That's, they, they are afraid that like, if we let these things mix too much, then our stuff magically won't hold value. I don't think yeah. any artists are, are worried about economics, you know, getting into art because that's just not how it works. Artists are gonna do the things that they think are meaningful um, and, they're going to be, you know, driven to do that work by the circumstances and the moments that they're in. And that's what's beautiful about art is that it like functions as an alternative history to the world. And, you know, it basically cannot be corrupted because it's about the corruption and, and about reacting to it and, and being where it is. So I'm not, I'm not worried about NFTs invading video games. I think I'm, you know, sad uh, that NFTs are going to continue to be super environmentally wasteful and, you know, ruin the real world. But, you know, and, and I wish I could be more excited about NFTs because I do think there's a lot of very cool conceptual stuff happening here, but- A I small price to pay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you can square it with, you know, uh, building a new technology to destroy the planet. Uh, it does have some super villainy. It's like, yeah, if you're going to build a tool to destroy the planet, like yeah. the, the the irony in this moment and time to to do that is uh, is very complicated. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, well, let's see. We have um, a couple minutes left. I do want to see if we can open it up for if anyone has any questions for Zach um, before we before we move on. All right. Let's see here. All right, um, we do have one question from, oh, uh, we had an anonymous question that came in asking if anyone had called the phone number on your time travel game. <laughs> um, not yet. Not yet, so the answer is no. All right, Daniel Green has asked, um, um, Daniel Green has asked um, that they've always found Sage Solitaire's uh, true grit mode fascinating, even if they're too scared to play it. There's a logical line between that and lose-lose. And they wanted to know if this type of extreme risk reward system has permeated any of your later mobile games or whether you've moved away from teaching that particular concept or lesson. Sure. <laughs> so, so true grit mode and Sage Solitaire. Uh, Sage Solitaire has sort of like a wagering mode. Um, oh yeah, maybe you just explain Sage Solitaire real it's quick. It's like a solitaire game. Imagine if you were just playing solitaire, but you could wager on it. I mean, Sage Solitaire is quite different than normal solitaire, but that's the short version. Um, and uh, so Sage Solitaire has a, a wagering mode, and one of the modes is a mode where you can never get your your cash back. So if you fail and you run out of, of cash to not real cash, right? There's no real cash. It's just you start with you know five hundred dollars, and if you lose it, you're out. You can't play True Grit anymore. You can't access the leaderboards. You can't do anything. Um, yeah, I think that that was definitely super connected to lose lose, and I do think that's something that um, I'm interested still in. Um, you know, I think that there's a uh, there's I don't know there's like a very special intensity that games have when their consequences are really intense and serious. Um, and I think it's a very magical thing that you can do with video games to be able to be played yeah. intense consequences. Um, but you also have to just be very careful about where those things fit in because, um, I, you know, I, I at least want to, uh, I want, if I'm going to put them in a game that's meant to be like broadly accessible, I want to make sure that it fits in naturally and is like, you know, in just one part of the game and doesn't take over. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, well, 
great. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, one last question is, I'm sure you get this a lot for, um, from JD Gardner was asking about for independent, for other creators out there. It's very, uh, it's very tremendously rewarding, but um, very difficult and exhausting. And was wondering for other people who are aspiring to do work like you do, what motivates you, keeps you going um, for people who are working solo, which is a unique, it's a unique type of pain to be working on anything creative by yourself. So what advice you might give to someone who's, who's embarking on that journey? Um, I was actually just talking to one of my friends about this. I think the, the most important thing is to find the work that makes you feel free and do that. Um, because that's the stuff that you will do regardless of how exhausting it is. Um, and, you know, I think when you're trying to figure out how to keep, keep up the work, you need to, you know, find the things that will make you feel freer than not. And, um, for me, I live in a world where I'm uh, constantly tormented by uh, the pile up of, of ideas that I know that are good, that I've tested and I've built prototypes and I know the games are fun, or I know that the art is going to be interesting. And I feel like, um, you know, in this partnership with my subconscious, I'm the one who's flagging here. I have to, you know, I owe it to my inner self to get this thing done and get it out and put it in the world and have it be there. Yeah, um, I think that sense of responsibility is like a endlessly crushing weight on me. And so being able to, you know, spend the time to put these things out every time I put something out, uh, it makes me feel a little bit lighter. And I think that's how I can sort of continue to keep doing it. All right. Well, Zach, thank you so much. Um, really, really appreciate you making time. We could have talked for like another hour. I mean, maybe we'll do something with, <laughs> we can explore the NFT question a bit more in depth okay. uh, another another time. Uh, but uh, thank you everybody for, um, thank you everybody for, for joining us today. Um, be sure to check out Zach's work online. Um, please follow us on Instagram kill, at killscreen.com. Um, we also have a newsletter that goes out every week and um, we are, it's our third event. We'll be planning more in the future. So please stay on the lookout. We'll be promoting uh, future events. Uh, and this will also be available online. So if you wanna go back and replay something that Zach said or um, something that you were curious about about, feel free to keep an eye out. We'll, we'll send you an email. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right. Take care. Thanks for having me.